format of this evening. Um, there's going to be a personal story, then there's going to be a short talk, and then we're going to have a panel discussion at the end. So there'll be plenty of time to ask questions. Now, there's two ways that you can ask questions tonight. Um, you can either just pop them in the Zoom chat, or you can go to www.slido.com and type in the little pin there, which is 44833. Um, and they'll be posted anonymously into Slido, and then we can ask um, our panelists these questions. Um, now, two things just quickly as well. If you can put your view on Zoom on speaker view, um, it's in the top right-hand corner. Um, and that just means that whoever's talking, whoever's speaking, and when we have our panelists, you'll be able to see those three people spotlighted. So you'll be able to engage um, a little bit better. And then secondly, it will be recorded, um, but only the first part, this personal story, and then the talk. Um, and then we'll stop recording after that. So the panel um, and that discussion won't be recorded at all. Um, so yeah, tonight is going to finish because we want to respect your guys' times um, at 9 p.m. But we will have um, breakout rooms after for 15 minutes. Um, so we'll be finishing officially at quarter past nine if you guys are keen to stick around. Sweet. Yeah. Um, yeah, so before we just um, head on into this evening's uh, topic, we're just going to do a quick little recap about what we talked about last week. So last week, Andrew Tuddy, the main man who's actually on tech tonight, so he's sweating a bit about that. He's uh, he's just going to give us a like, really short recap about how things went uh, last Monday. Hi guys. Yeah, it went it went really, really well. I think we had some really interesting conversations, some great Q&A. Um, another Andrew uh, did the personal story, which I think a lot of people related to. And then I gave the talk, which was comfort in COVID. So it was based around suffering and weighing up the atheist view uh, and the Christian view in suffering. And to break it down really quickly, effectively, what I was saying was, if you're an atheist, you don't believe in God. If you don't believe in God, it's you, you don't have any kind of moral laws or moral law giver. There's no moral law giver. You take away God, you take away the moral law, you take away good and evil, you take away suffering because it doesn't exist necessarily if there's no good and there's no evil. Uh, and you're kind of trivializing su suffering then, you know, so suffering isn't really a problem because it's just kind of made up. Uh, and then in comparison, we took the Christian view uh, and we said, although Christianity doesn't give the answer to why suffering exists it does give you the tools and resources to deal with it it gives you comfort that we're not alone jesus christ himself died on the cross you know he lived here on earth and he suffered that, that the pain um, of rejection from friends from family and from his own father uh, we, we we also had hope hope for a future restoration you know as christians we believe in heaven uh, and for a great restoration that that not only but there'll be no suffering, but there'll be joy. There'll be, there'll be feasts. There'll be, yeah, it'll be amazing. And then finally, so we comfort and hope and then peace. And um, that suffering is not meaningless. Even though we, we might not know why it happens. We know we have a great God uh, and he, and it's happening for a reason. So uh, it didn't give the answer to why suffering happened, but it gave you the resources uh, to, to handle it uh, and more so than any other worldview or religion in the world. Sweet. Uh, thanks, Andy. Um, yes. Yeah, so last week when it got to kind of the discussion part, um, it was class because there was brilliant debate, but it was like respectful and it was graceful and it was just like an awesome platform for just really good discussion. And, and that's what we really want here at Intro is just to be able to discuss, you know, if we stand on opposite sides of things, well, let's talk about it. Let's let's find out more about what we're all thinking. So that's what was class last week. And that's what we're really looking forward to this week. Um, so, yeah, we're going to dive into it. And uh, the first thing we're going to do is hand over um, to the main man, Lucas, with the beard there. Um, I was trying to tell him to shave off the beard and just leave the moustache from November but he's completely against it, but that's another thing. Um, yeah, um, so Lucas, we're gonna hand over to you. Uh, we're gonna, yeah, share your personal story and we're so excited to hear it. So over to you, Lucas. Yeah, thanks. Uh, nobody would be better off if I shaved this beard and uh, I'll be in the doghouse with the wife anyways. Um, but uh, thanks for having me on to actually share the story. I've met some of the people that you see on screen and some of the people in the chat, uh, thanks for coming, know me, but not that many of you, I'd say, know my story from zero on up. Um, part of that is because I was raised in Barbados in the Caribbean. Um, 
why am I in Ireland? Yeah, I know we'll get there, but um, I was raised in Barbados with an uh, Irish father and actually a very strong Catholic um, grandmother who lived in the house with us. And um, there was really encouraging, strong family. My, so because of that kind of Catholic upbringing, we'd be going to church most Sundays during the year. And of course, they had a big Christmas situation, but I don't think my parents believed that side. I think kind of did it out of duty or respect to my grandmother. My dad was raised in Holy Catholic Ireland in the 70s. And so he, in his head, he'd done his stint in the Catholic Church. And he wasn't really worried about carrying on um, that faith. He'd made his decisions about that. But um, I went probably because it was it was good for me and my brother, um, a good influence on us. Um, and I remember God a lot of the time at that stage being like Santa Claus. And this is like when I was age six or seven. He was he was real. I, th- I thought of him as a real thing that existed. But I only need to worry about him a couple of times a year, like when I'm being threatened with not getting presents or, or something like that. It was a very temporary a, a background thing and it's and like even more through my teen years you know he was in the background every now and again you think about him and sometimes it's uncomfortable and and that kind of situation but god wasn't somebody or something that i interacted with day to day at all i didn't i didn't know what that meant really um as time went on when i was in secondary school there was a weekly youth group i attended um and that was kind of Bible centered. So you'd go, you'd have a chat about the Bible and you'd read a passage and then you'd kind of hang out with people your age for the rest of the evening. And I was really there for that more than anything. You know, I wasn't very popular and I wanted to be and everyone there was cool and I am. So I turned up mainly for that. It, it wasn't, I wasn't really respecting what it was about or what it was for. And yet there were times when, um, during that time when I was involved in it, when I thought about God at that stage is, I still, he was still in the background, but those conversations became less comfortable. Um, when I was reflecting on myself and who am I and am I, am I good? Am I a good person? What does that mean? Those questions started to become pretty uncomfortable. Um, but, you know, I wasn't going to address them. They're uncomfortable. And then when Friday is over, well, I don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, and I kind of, I want to put it in perspective that I was a, a decent kid. My parents were really caring and really encouraging and they put everything they could all their time into me. Um, and that was a big part of my life, but that whole uncomfortable feeling kind of came from this emptiness and this hopelessness that was in me, you know, in those those quiet moments when you're by yourself, that was that was there too. And I didn't know how to deal with this emptiness and this hopelessness. Um, and you you further and further into teenage years, this becomes a much, much bigger problem because I could admit to myself at certain points that I believed in God or that I believe he existed, but I wasn't in right standing with, with what he wanted. I wasn't good enough or I, I was something I was doing was wrong that I, and I couldn't fix. And that was the biggest thing. I couldn't fix it myself. Um, and so when I was 16, that whole internal conflict of um, those questions, like who am I and what am I worth and what gives me a value at, is there answer to these in my head I knew there was an answer and that answer was in God and in Jesus but um I was trying my hardest to avoid that answer whatsoever I didn't I wasn't willing at all to engage with that answer being the correct one I was trying every other way I could to to fix myself and to and to make myself better by my own brute force and I really just it it wasn't working whatsoever um and I remember there was a night where I sat by myself um late at night and finally made that decision to just drop it, to drop the, this pride and this, this uh, insecurity, put my value in the hands of this concept of grace that I'd read about and been told about, but had not been willing to accept. Um, and so that grace, what I'm talking about is described in the Bible as a gift to anyone who seeks it, it's choosing to accept your failures and accept your inability to be good enough because none of us can be good enough based on the Bible standards. Um, and when I put my worth, instead of being into how many good deeds did I do and how good were my good deeds, how many old ladies can you walk across the road? Instead, putting my value in the sacrifice that Jesus made for everyone. You know, it's not in, it's not how great am I, it's how great is the person that I choose to follow or, or the person I want to make my uh, mentor is the wrong word to say, the person I'm putting up as, as the, the example. That really changed how I looked to myself and how I looked to my life. Um, 
and I, when I accepted a gift, it was a gift that I didn't deserve and no one who accepts it uh, deserves, but that's kind of the point of it being uh, a gracious gift. It, it isn't one that I deserved or earned, it's one I accepted. Um, and so as a little bit of an aside, I'm thinking about grace and like why that system, why are we choosing a system of beliefs over all of the hundreds of other systems of beliefs that people appear to be quite happy following. Um, and I, I don't have a, the one answer to solve that, but I know for me, it was made more sense than more of a karmic view, as in, uh, you know, you do good things, good things come back to you kind of thing. Because when I went deeper into thinking about it, that's almost kind of arbitrary in terms of, well, who, who, where defines what is good and how good it is. And it can also be kind of arbitrary and callous and unequal um, in a karmic system, depending on a lot of uncontrollable um, circumstances. Like who is the judge of what's good and bad in, a slum in India where you are, is it okay to steal food then for your survival? You know, all these little bitty rules that kind of, I, I couldn't really compute with that being a an equal or a all encompassing system as opposed to grace where everyone comes under the same, um, the same, we're all equal in our sin, I should say. Um, and we can't work our way to get to heaven. We can't put our glory of my works over and say, I deserve to be here because it's just too much. It takes that human pride away from your own work and gives it to God. And therefore, no matter where you are, no matter how you have got to where you are, you are equal uh, because of what you put your faith in, not because of all the great stuff you did and how amazing you are. Um, for me, that decision to put my pride and selfishness and insecurities up and to put my value in that grace was a humongous weight off my shoulders um, at the time and to this day. Uh, there was no more holding all these wrongs of my head and like some families and friends can even do it was a forgiveness that was true and impactful and encouraged me to seek better things rather than treat like a free pass which is a, it's a good question to ask why not that's a free pass to do whatever you want if you just accept everything uh but it wasn't it really encouraged me to 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 change how i wanted to live um if i was to use one word i would say give me peace or hope it was peace in the, every moment that used to be uncomfortable and scary and hopeless. Uh, and, and also for next week and for whenever I die, it gave me peace in those times. It gave me peace no matter what people say about me um, and peace for security and being vulnerable with friends like or strangers like you all. I can tell you my story and I'm not ashamed or scared to do so. Um, and I can share my struggles and face life with support from friends who became uh, like brothers to me. Um, finally, um, I have peace for those that I've lost, um, and some of you in the chat know what I mean, and I've learned to let go and be grateful for their places in my life. Um, in the moments when the world is cruel and dark, I had peace not to become bitter towards injustice, um, but to accept my spot in the world and, and try and make it better in any small way that I could. Um, so that internal peace drove me to finally seek out caring for those around me rather than worrying about all of my failures. Um, it's what led me to being a teacher, which I have just started a new job in today. I'm really thankful to, to say um, the chance to let young people know that they're valuable, that they're loved and they're worth fighting for, that there is a hope um, that they can look forward to. And that to me is a real driving force. Um, and that will kind of lead us on to tonight's topic of is there hope? Um, and personally, I believe in Jesus, there is a hope bigger than an individual and more consistent and secure than the greatest role model. Um, or stock or job or whatever else. Um, I kind of think or hope is evident in how we live. We're not living for today. We're looking forward to a better future um, that is different for each, whatever we have in mind. Um, and we have, you know, we have an idea of a heaven maybe or a, and a better earth as well. Um, without that hope, I guess my final words, without that hope, my life would be much more selfish, nihilistic, miserable play a toxic place and in all honesty i don't even know if i would have made it to 25 at all um without that complete shift in ideals and with that faith that i have in god uh that's me i hope i haven't gone over time thanks i'm going to hand over to rebecca and lena again thank you so much lucas um that was awesome and um yeah, it's just, it's just always cool to hear someone's personal story and the journey you've been on. Um, so we just like really appreciate you sharing with us. That was awesome. Um, so yeah, 
Next thing we're going to do is dive in uh, to our talk. Okay, so I'm going to hand you over in one second to Steve. Um, so Steve is the pastor of Christ City Church. Um, he also works for HubSpot. Uh, he studied maths and philosophy, would you believe, at university. Um, and yeah, just an all-round good bloke. So here you go, Steve. Um, we'll hand over to you. Is there hope um, in 2020? So um, over, you, over to you, Steve. Great, thanks. All-round good bloke. That's just the way you want to be introduced. Uh, thank you. Yeah, is there hope? Does Jesus' resurrection provide any answers? For those of you that have seen the uh, film or read the book, uh, The Two Towers, uh, by Lord, uh, by Lord of the Rings, uh, by uh, Tolkien. You know that one of the central themes that, that the film develops is the power of hope, and is brilliantly portrayed at the end of the film. Frodo uh, is rapidly losing hope that they will finish the journey and destroy the ring, and they're going to end all evil and darkness. I just read the books again in lockdown all this time, and it's such a gripping moment, like just that the, the despair that Frodo starts to feel. And so Sam starts to reminisce about the stories that they learned, stories that they'd come to love, stories that they believed to be true, stories that inspired them with hope. And this is how the conversation goes. Sam says, those were stories that stayed with you. They meant something, even if you were too small to understand why. But I think, Mr. Frodo, that I do understand. Folk in those stories had lots of chances of turning back, only they didn't. They kept going because they were holding on to something. Frodo then says, well, what are we holding on to, Sam? And Sam says this, that there is some good in this world and it's worth fighting for. And every human heart longs for that to be true, that there's something good in this world to hold on to, that there's something worth fighting for, that we don't have to give up and turn back, that we don't have to despair. And now more than ever, our generation in 2020 is facing a terrible pandemic where we're having to go, where is our hope and how can we hope and is there hope? Many of the things that we have typically hoped in, you can't count on them anymore. Financial prosperity, physical health, continual progress, social order, a future that you can plan, more than 5K that you can walk, you know, or go a life of, of happiness. Well, None of those things. The virus is exposing that our hopes maybe weren't solid enough. So the question tonight is, um, can we find hope? And if so, how? And I think the answer is yes. But to, to get to that answer, I want to do two things. I want to look at a secular view of hope and how that if you get rid of God, I think you, you're not left with any more hope. Uh, what reassurance do you have? What, what do you have worth fighting for? And secondly, the Christian view of hope that how in Jesus and his resurrection, we have a guaranteed, concrete, personal, and beautiful hope. And if you were with us the last couple of times, you'll know we sort of tackle it from two angles. We look at it intellectually and sort of critique and compare and contrast and examine the Christian worldview versus other worldviews. And then we look at the personal answers. You know, you and I are real people. Lucas is a real person. He's just shared his real story. What, look, what is the hope? in these strange days? What resources are available to us to give us hope? So firstly, intellectually, the secular view of hope, which is summarized, I guess, by the idea of human progress. Here, I rely on a thinker that some of you know called Tim Keller and his book, Making Sense of God, and a recent talk he did on this. And he cites Robert Nisbet, his famous book from the 80s, History of the Idea of Progress. And Nisbet explains, and I don't believe Nisbet was a, a theist or a believer in any way, but ancient people, Babylonians, Chinese, Hindus, Greeks, everyone at the time just saw time in history as cyclical. So it was going nowhere. And some thought it was actually declining. The Greeks kind of had this idea of progress, like if we can grow in our thoughts, then we could develop our thoughts and our societies. But there was no real idea of progress until the Christian idea came along through Jesus that the kingdom of God is at hand. And with the kingdom of God, there is an idea of progress. Society can get better. History is not going round and round in circles. History is going somewhere. So the idea of the kingdom of God that meant for the first time in the history of the world, there was an idea of progress. But then what happened was in the, 19, in the 1750s, belief in God started to decline and Europe became more secular. 
And people rejected the idea of Christian hope through the kingdom of God, but they kept on to the idea of progress of human history that had originally come from the Bible, but they ditched the Bible and kept the idea. Philosophers began to talk about humanity progress, more information, more technology, more financial prosperity, the industrial revolution, and of course, Darwin with his theory of evolution, where the world is getting stronger and stronger and better and better as the weak are getting left behind. So the idea of progress and hope for the future without God became very real for, for a good while, 100, 100 years. But then at the start of the 20th century, there was a very, very bad 30 to 50 years for our world. 1914, World War I, one, 40 million people killed. 1918, We've now all learned about it, haven't we? The Spanish plague. We're not quite sure how many it killed because of the politics at the time, but estimates are at 50 million. 1930s, the Great Depression, GDP decline of 27%, 25% unemployment. And then in 1939, World War II, 75 million people killed. The whole idea that history is getting better, that we're progressing, there's hope for the future. It fell on hard times. But that was 75 to 100 years ago. So you and I on this call, none of us are old enough to remember that. And many of us don't even have parents that remember it now. So we've never experienced the tragedies. And so the secular idea of progress has had a resurgence and a revival. We had 9-11. Okay, that shook the world. We had the 2008 crash that shook the world. But nothing like those 50 years at the start of the 20th century. But then recently... It's all started to unravel, hasn't it, in our world? Haven't you noticed that? Haven't you felt it? The pandemic, of course, which has been aided. It's been exponentially increased, you could say, or, 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 or enabled through globalization, which we've enabled. The environmental crisis, global warming, you know, David Attenborough stuff, pollutions of the oceans. Is our world getting better? Rogue states, you know, Line 11, terrorists who want to kill and create havoc have nothing really positive to add to our world. Technology. I work for a tech company, but maybe we've created a monster. The surveillance state, the fake news, the undermining of democracy. Who can we trust anymore? We're not sure, are we now? Is society really progressing? 2020s pull all that up in the air for us. How do you see it on the ground? Suicide rates going up, people needing counselors, antidepressants, birth rates in the, in the West going down. But maybe most of all, you see it in the arts, the big recent hits, House of Cards, Mad Men, Breaking Bad, Love, Hate. There is no sense of progress. There is no hope in these series. They're all characterized by anti-heroes and anti-hope in a sense. No truth, no hope, no righteousness, no light in the darkness, just darkness. There's nothing to hope for. It's an increasing spiral of evil and darkness. I couldn't get to the end of two. I, I got most of the way through Breaking Bad and House of Cards. I was like, there's nothing to cheer for. It's just darkness. What's going on? Signs of hopelessness. Our culture is saying, is there hope? You see, the secular idea of, of, of hope had two great problems that were unaccounted for as they get rid of the Bible, but kept the idea of progress. The first one is the problem of human nature. And the second problem was the problem of total oblivion. The problem of human nature, if you think society is progressing, to a greater end, what do you do with Auschwitz? The secular idea would assume that as we increased in knowledge and technology, we'd use the knowledge and technology properly. That the, as our knowledge increased, so our moral compass would increase. We'd use the knowledge and the power and the technology and the finance for the good of others, but we didn't. Here we had a leader named Hitler, very wealthy, aiming to progress society, further his race, and he's using the best technology to slaughter 6 million Jews. What do you do with that? Well, there's two answers, a liberal answer and a conservative answer. The liberal answer says people who commit great crimes are victims of unjust social structures. They had a bad family upbringing, they had bad schooling. When people do bad things, it's because bad things happen to them. Are you gonna say that about the Nazis? Victims of unjust social structures? You trivialize the evil if you go with the liberal answer to Auschwitz. Well, let's go with the conservative answer. Those Nazis are terrible people, awful people, evil, not like us. They're subhuman. <gasps> what? They're subhuman? 
I've now become Hitler, haven't I? What have I done? I'm treating one group of people as less and therefore I have a kind of right to just sort of discard them from human history. That's what Hitler did. I'm now the Nazi. I've denied the common humanity that can turn any of us into an oppressor. First answer, the liberal answer, Nazis couldn't help it. You can't say that. Second answer, Nazis are subhuman. You can't say that. So what's the right answer? Well, I think it's the Christian one that in each one of us, there is the ability to do such things as those atrocities because there is evil within us. And the Bible calls that sin. We are warped on the inside. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, I think that's how you pronounce his name, famously talked about this in Gulag Archipelago, a book that talks about his life in the Gulag and the communist, Soviet, um, the communist Soviet forced labor camps. And he says, the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart and through all human hearts. So the secular idea of human progress didn't take into account the problem of human nature, the problem of the heart. We're not a morally good species. And as we progress, we don't use that progression for good. So the progress brings harm, harm to others in war. We kill each other, harm to the environment as we overuse it and abuse it, harm to ourselves as we end up in addictions, harm to society when we, do, you know, well, you know, the Black Lives Movement, you know, the Black Lives Movement and all the rest. It, we kill each other based on race or whatever. There's a second problem, the problem of ultimate oblivion. You see, the secular view says if we're, we're all progressing, humanity is progressing, we're moving forward, more knowledge, more technology, more, you know, wait a minute, we're here by accident, there's no supernatural, there's no life after death, one day the sun will collapse and our world will cease to exist, one day there is total and utter oblivion, with the death of the sun will be the death of civilization. We're progressing to what? doesn't give me any hope. Well, why are we progressing to eternal nothingness? What does it matter what I do now? What does it matter if I try and progress my life now? In the end, it doesn't matter. We're just a blip. It's just total oblivion in the end. There's nothing to progress towards. Bertrand Russell famously wrote the book, Why I Am Not a Christian. Philosopher from Cambridge or Oxford, I can't remember which, put it like this. We are all destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system and all of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. The famous psychologist Carl Jung put it like this, death is indeed a fearful piece of brutality. There is no sense of pretending otherwise. It is brutal, not only as a physical event, but far more so psychically. A human being is torn away from us and what remains is the icy stillness of death. There no longer exists any hope of a relationship for all the bridges have been smashed at one blow. John Lennox, kind of a modern, he's, a, he's an apologist for the Christian faith and Oxford mathematical professor, he says this, removing God from the equation does not remove the pain and suffering. It leaves it untouched, but removing God does to remove what, something else, namely any kind of, kind of ultimate hope. In other words, you see, if this life is all there is, if when you die, you rot, if there's no greater story, no afterlife, no meta narrative, if we're all here by chance and there's no meaning, okay, you might create meaning for 70 years of your life on earth if you're lucky, but does that count towards any idea of progress of the world that we're going to a total oblivion in the end? No. No wonder society is running out of hope in the arts and the TV series have anti-heroes. It's the logical outworking of a secular worldview. So there are the two problems. The secular view of hope, this idea of human progress, the problem of human nature, and the problem of ultimate oblivion. But you and I need hope, don't we? We all need hope. We need something, as Sam says to Frodo, the story that we can believe that we can hold on to. Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl is the classic tribute to hope from the Holocaust. It has sold more than 12 million copies uh, since it was first published in German in 1946. Frankl was one of the world's leading psychiatrists of his day and spent three years of his life in four different concentration camps. 
The book is a meditation and a meaning on the, how to find inner reasons for hope that mean you can survive the atrocity of the Holocaust. It's a great read. And at one point he says this, the prisoner who's lost hope for the future, his future was doomed. Woe to him who saw no more sense in this life, no aim, no purpose, and therefore no point in carrying on. He was soon lost. Typical reply which such a man, uh, uh, which such a man rejected all encouraging arguments was, I have nothing to expect from life anymore. That's what Frankel heard as he went around the concentration camps as a psychiatrist, and he says this, what sort of answer can one give to that? In other words, you've lost hope. There's nothing you can give about someone now. And he says those that were able to survive the Holocaust had a hope, you know, of a loved one they were going to meet again or of a God that they believed in. It was something outside of themselves that enabled them to have hope. So I want to look at the Christian idea of hope and how the Christian idea, because of the idea of resurrection, again, a uniquely Christian idea, gives hope in a way that no other worldview does. I want to do it first by reading one of my favorite passages from the Bible in John's Gospel, where Jesus, who was crucified three days earlier, meets Mary Magdalene and hope is rekindled. This is how the story goes. Now, Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus's body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked a woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I've seen the Lord. And she told them that, she had, that, that he had said these things to her. Let me explain three ideas that come from the Christian idea of hope because of the resurrection. Christian hope is concrete. It is beautiful. And it is guaranteed. Firstly, it is concrete. Look at the story. A physical man with a physical woman in a physical garden. This is significant if you're a Jewish writer like the, the Apostle John who wrote the gospel. The Bible starts off with a physical man with a physical woman in a garden that God had made, the Garden of Eden. And it was a beautiful world. It's the world we inhabit. And it's the world where we can enjoy things and create things and progress. That world went wrong through sin. But right here now we have God, the great gardener, which is what Mary accidentally calls him, remaking our world and saying all of the evil is going to be gone. All the things that make this world not beautiful and progress are soon to be gone because I've been raised. The Bible's promise is not simply we live forever in an immaterial spiritual paradise removed from this world. The end of history, the last book in the Bible, says that we do not ascend into heaven, but heaven ascends to earth. And the purifying beauty and power of God descend into this physical, material world. And all the suffering and aging and disease and poverty are removed. We, not only, we look not only for the resurrection of our souls, but our bodies. So did you see Jesus says, do not hold on to me? One day Mary can hold on to him, but not now. It's a physical reality pointing forward to a physical new world that each of us can belong to. The Christian hope is a concrete world of a new heaven and a new earth. The secondly, the Christian hope is beautiful. What do I mean by that? Well, what really matters in life, and Lucas said it in his story, didn't he, is our loved ones. Here we have Mary in the garden with the one she loves. And there's no hint of sexual, there's no over sexual overtones in the stories. It's just joy and wonder of being with the one she loves. An unimaginable beauty and glory that Jesus must have had in his resurrection body. And that is what we all want. We want to live in a world of beauty and love where we can never be separated from our loved ones. That's why death is so fearful. As Carl Jung said, because there's no hope of relationship. But Jesus says to Mary, I'm ascending to my father and your father, 
my God and your God. In other words, what has happened to me, Jesus is saying, can happen to you too. I'm going to ascend to heaven and I'm going to come back one day and we can all be one big happy family in a sense. My God and your God. Join me in a community that's eternal, full of love. Howard Thurman was a mentor of Martin Luther King and an African-American scholar at Boston University. And he gave a famous lecture at Harvard in 1947 on the meaning of the African-American spirituality. He engaged the criticism that African-American spirituals were too otherworldly, too filled with references to heaven, to crowns and thrones and robes and golden streets and singers. And in the lecture, he answers the objection of the liberal scholars of his day. They say, you can't take all these, you know, talking about crowns and heaven, you know, as streets paved with gold. You can't take that literally. It's symbolic. And he pushes back and says, no, no, no. You can't tell a slave that that's just a symbol. Imagine how ludicrous it is to sit down with a slave in the 19th century and say, listen, you know all that stuff in the Bible, it talks about a physical reality and glory and riches and joy. Uh, and none of that's true. There's no judgment day in which the wrongs that have been done to you will be put right. There's no future world and, and life in which every desire you have will be satisfied. This life is all there is. When you die, you're off. You simply cease to exist. Our real hope for for it lies in this world being a better world and improved social policy. Now, keep those things in mind. Keep your head up. You know, live with courage and love. My dear slave, don't despair. No. The slaves could sing the songs of the gospel because they knew there was hope in the world to come. These weren't mere symbols. This was a reality. The world to come was going to repay all the injustices of this world that they have faced. Christian hope is concrete it's a physical world and it's beautiful every desire of our heart will be met thirdly christian hope is guaranteed how do you know steve do you remember the two problems do you remember them the problem of human nature and the problem of total oblivion how is the christian answer to hope dealt with them human nature there's evil within us why did jesus die to deal with the evil within us to deal with the sin and to cancel our debt and to forgive us and give us new hearts. We can be renewed inside. So all our progress can only be used for good purposes. And what about the problem of total oblivion? The resurrection. We has been raised. Death has been defeated. Jesus has broken the power of death. Just as a creditor's power over us is broken when someone pays our debt fully, so death's claim and power over, over us has been broken when Jesus died in our place. We can now live this life that goes on forever. But here's the thing. Why do I say guaranteed? Because it's not a theory. This isn't a make-believe idea. It's guaranteed because it's based on a historical event in history that can never be changed. History can never be changed. That's why history can be sometimes so horrible, but it's why it's so powerful. If my hope for the future is based on an event in history that can never cha be changed, the resurrection of Christ, then my hope is guaranteed. You put your hope in looks, in money, in sport, in success, in academia, in relationships, in popularity, in civilization improving, and society getting better. You know, it's just an idea. You have no idea whether that's going to happen. In fact, we're seeing a lot of it isn't happening. But the Christian hope is unshakable because it's based on something in history that's never going to change. Jesus rose from the dead. Now, there's an obvious objection to this. What evidence is there? Steve, that Jesus rose from the dead. Well, you can see her, can't you? Mary. If you were going to make up a story as a group of early disciples in the first century and come up with this nice idea to give you some kind of fake hope, A, that's ludicrous, and B, why would you put Mary as the first eyewitness of the resurrection? We know in the first century, women did not have a, uh, their voice did not count, uh, you know, have credibility in the court of law. So you'd only put Mary as the first eyewitness if that was the way it actually was. And, and there's more evidence we can talk about in the Q&A. But you're looking at her, Mary, and a changed life, and the changed life of the church, and the, the church rising up out of the Roman Empire, and slaves in the 19th century singing while they were slaves. There's something about the power of a changed life. 
Lucas's story. A changed life. He had peace, he said. He had hope. So we can find hope in 2020. I think so. If you go with the secular idea that there is no God, I'm not sure where you get hope. I don't. But if Jesus rose from the dead, you have all the resources you need, even in these tough and strange days we live in. Because the Christian hope is concrete, it's beautiful, it's guaranteed. It can sweeten and bring contentment to your heart, even in dark days like now. Let me finish with this. Mary had lost hope, hadn't she? She was crying. Jesus had been taken from her and she didn't know where he was. What did the future hold? For us, so much has been taken from us in 2020. I don't know what your life story is or your last 12 months is, but every one of us has a story of loss, of, of saying something has been taken away and I just don't know how it's all going to fit together. COVID-19 has left us like Mary, crying and isolated. What changes Mary? Jesus calls her name. That's my story. I heard him calling my name. That's Lucas's story. That can be everyone's story. That's the story of the slaves in, in the 19th century. When the resurrected Jesus calls your name, COVID-19 doesn't stand a chance. The hope is rekindled. And maybe actually COVID-19 has unblocked the ears and softened your heart to maybe hear him calling you. Stop resisting him. He's promising you a great future if you'll follow him. So thanks for listening. I'm going to hand back over to the host and I look forward to the questions.